my name is Lee Tips. My partner, Jonna Schooley, and I will be providing a brief overview of a cognitive behavioral intervention called Coping Cat. Coping Cat is a manualized cognitive behavioral intervention that was adapted, researched, and developed for children 7 to 13 years of age who are experiencing abnormally high anxiety levels that negatively impact their social and academic functioning. This population consists of children diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, separation anxiety disorder, and social phobia. Excessive childhood anxiety can have long-term implications for adolescent and adult functioning if not treated. Adolescents report significantly higher levels of anxiety and depression over time, indicating these symptoms worsen as the child ages. This intervention teaches adaptive skills to recognize, prevent, or reduce feelings of anxiety by using a workbook as a guide. The therapist and child work together to evaluate the child's reactions and previous behaviors in anxiety-provoking experiences. Then using this information, they develop a plan for coping with anxiety in future situations. To better understand how Coping Cat works, one needs to understand the basic structure of CBT. Cognitive behavioral therapy focuses on exploring the relationships between an individual's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors to uncover unhealthy patterns of thoughts that lead to self-destructive beliefs and behaviors. Then the individual is exposed to situations ranging from low stress and anxiety to high stress and anxiety so that the individual can practice newly acquired coping skills. Anxiety disorders share common features of excessive and or overly persistent fear and anxiety, plus behavioral disturbances beyond that which is considered developmentally normative. The number of diagnoses of anxiety disorders in children is increasing. Some research indicates one in eight children suffer from these disorders, while other studies indicate one in five. The word anxiety comes from Latin, meaning uneasy or troubled. The working definition for our purposes today is a vague, which is the operative word, sense of not being safe or feeling unease, characterized by apprehension, which is both cognitive and emotional, and restlessness. Anxiety is the subjective experience of an activated alarm system. Nature has provided humans with a complex body system that consists of many components that are activated when a human is alarmed. The limbic system, attentional mechanisms, endocrine system, and the sympathetic nervous system, just to name a few. When activated, the emotional response is first, at times below conscious knowledge, and then the instinctive startle response. Once the conscious mind activates and asks, what, what is it, the child moves to act with caution quite normal until it becomes excessive. Coping Cat consists of four components, recognizing anxious feelings and physical reactions, clarifying feelings when in anxiety-provoking situations, developing and implementing a coping plan, and evaluating performance and self-reinforcement. The empirically supported intervention provides a manual which allows the intervention to be implemented with fidelity, but includes flexible options, allowing the therapist to respond to a client's individual needs and concerns. It was designed to be delivered at community agencies, group homes, hospitals, residential care facilities, and schools. The minimum qualifications of providers is not set. However, resources are needed, such as the child workbook, therapist manual, office space, and access to an internet-connected computer if using the Computer Assistant Program. Coping Cat is implemented when the anxiety, worry, or physical symptoms cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, educational, or other areas of functioning. There are so many life situations children cannot control. Death of a pet or family member, the parents relocate the family, The parents leave either temporarily, such as business trips, or more or less permanently, such as divorce, feeling rejected or not mattering as much as a child would like, or physical injury of themselves or their attachment figure. Often children will not complain of being afraid, but will complain about physical symptoms. Coping Cat was originally an adult intervention that was adapted for children and adolescents. At that time, the DSM only had three disorders listed for children, over-anxious behavior, separation anxiety, and avoidant disorder. These disorders have evolved into the current diagnoses of general anxiety disorder, separation anxiety disorder, and social anxiety. Each of these disorders have criteria in common. 
the anxiety, worry, or physical symptoms cause clinically significant distress. The disturbance cannot be attributable to physiological effects of substance abuse or medical conditions and cannot be better explained by another mental disorder. Generalized anxiety disorder also include excessive anxiety or worry occurring more days than not for at least six months. They feel restlessness, fatigue, an inability to concentrate, irritability, muscle tension, and sleep disturbance. GAD etiology includes biological, family, and environmental factors. Biological factors are behavioral intuition and temperament associated with an aversion to novel situations. And research indicates that there is an association between parents with anxiety disorders and children with behavioral inhibition. Family may also create issues in that parents model anxious behavior or family behaviors reinforce the anxious behavior of the child or there's a disruptive attachment. Environmental factors include stressful life events and traumatic experiences. The age of onset of GAD varies, but it's more common in older children and adolescents. Prevalence in children and adolescents ranges between 2.9 and 4.6%. In children, GAD is equally distributed between males and females. However, in adolescents, there's a ratio of 6 to 1 females to males. Our second disorder, separation anxiety, causes significant negative effects within areas of social and emotional functioning, family life, and physical health. In school, children may have difficulty adapting to and functioning within their environment. They may engage in disruptive behaviors or refuse to attend schools. Symptoms of separation anxiety include significant anxiety and fear atypical of age and development over separation from people or places to which the child has a strong attachment. These symptoms must last at least four weeks. Persistent and excessive worry over losing major attachment figures, fear of being alone, reluctance or refusal to sleep away from home, or nightmares are also symptoms of separation anxiety. SAD etiology is similar to GAD etiology and includes biologic, family, and environmental factors. Biologic factors are similar to those of GAD. Family factors include overprotective parents and intrusive parenting. And environmental factors uh, include stressful life events, traumatic experiences, and change of environment. The age of onset of SAD is generally preschool age or after at any time during childhood more rarely during adolescence. Prevalence in children under 12 years of age between 6 and 12 months is 4%. In clinical samples, disorder is more equally distributed between males and females. However, in the community, it's more frequent in females. Our third disorder is social anxiety or phobia. Symptoms of social anxiety include marked fear or anxiety in social situations when potentially exposed to possible scrutiny by peers or adults. Fear of being negatively evaluated, rejected, or causing offense to others while demonstrating anxiety symptoms. Social situations almost always provoke anxiety are, and are avoided and endured with intense fear and anxiety. And the reactions are out of all proportion to the actual threat. These symptoms are persistent by terms of six months or more. And if another medical condition is present, fear and anxiety is clearly unrelated or excessive to the actual situation. Similar to the other two disorders, social anxiety etiology consists of biologic, family, and environmental factors. Biologic factors may include genetically predisposition, temperament, or social inhibition or shyness. Family may include over-anxious or protective parents or socially anxious parents that are modeling behavior for the child. And the environment may include situations in which the child was bullied or humiliated or rejected by his peers. Onset of social anxiety in the United States is 13 years of age. 75% of individuals who suffer social anxiety range between the ages of 8 and 15 years. The 12-month prevalence in children or adolescents is approximately 7%, but that decreases with age. Social anxiety is higher in females than in males at a ratio of 1.5 to 2.2%, and the gender difference is more pronounced in adolescents and in young adults. We would like to take just a few minutes to look at the research that led to the development of Coping Cat. The first evaluation was completed in 1994 by Philip Kendall, followed by a second study in 1997. Group and individual studies took place in 2000, 
and an evaluation of a Dutch adaptation took place in 2003. Since then, both Canada and Australia have evaluated their adaptations of Coping Cat as well. Little attention was paid to anxiety disorders in children until the 16th century, and then the wrong kind of attention was paid in the form of religious rights, incarceration, abandonment, and witch hunts. In 1978, a growing concern for the mental health of children prompted the attention of the President's Commission of Mental Health. Statistics within that report indicated 10 to 20 percent of children may have required mental health services, but research in the 1990s indicated fewer than 20% of those children actually received the treatment that they needed. In developing treatment for anxious adults, a significant number of the patients reported that their symptoms had begun in childhood and worsened over time. Obviously, more research was needed to diagnose and treat at much younger ages. In 1994, at the time of Philip Kendall's first article on treating anxiety in children, there were three childhood anxiety disorders in the DSM separation anxiety, avoidant disorder, and overanxious disorder. At that time, there had been no known randomized clinical trial on the effects of any psychosocial intervention for children with these disorders. Research on the treatment of adults had elicited adult treatment programs, but little research had been done on the role of cognition in childhood anxiety and on the effect of child therapy. Dr. Philip Kendall is recognized as a leader in research for childhood anxiety and treatment, and his 1994 study was the first to concentrate on treatment for children with anxiety. Dr. Kendall's article evaluated his psychosocial treatment for 47 children ages 9 to 14. His treatment consisted of a 16-session cognitive behavioral treatment compared with a waitlist condition. Child self-reports, parent reports, teacher reports, Cognitive assessments and behavioral observation composed the pre-treatment assessment, and there was a post-treatment assessment with a one-year follow-up. Dr. Kendall's post-treatment assessment indicated 64% of the treated children no longer met diagnostic criteria, while only one of the waitlisted children no longer met diagnostic criteria. At the one-year follow-up, 38 children post-treatment means and follow-up means did not differ significantly providing support of the effectiveness of the treatment. Statistics indicated intervention likely alleviated emotional distress. In 1997, Dr. Kendall evaluated a sample of 94 children ranging in ages from 9 to 13. This second study was considered a replication and an extension of the 1994 study focusing on treatment outcomes and maintenance at a one-year follow-up. Additionally, Dr. Kendall looked at the preliminary analysis of the influence of comorbidities and the effects of the various segments of treatment. The 1997 post-treatment assessment indicated 70% of treated children no longer met diagnostic criteria. The one-year follow-up indicated 85 children post-treatment means and follow-up means did not differ significantly providing support of the effectiveness of the treatment. The study was unable to determine whether comorbidity affected treatment outcomes as sample sizes did not permit comparisons. It also indicated the first half of the treatment by itself was not responsible for the gains produced by the entire treatment. In 2000 and 2005, Flannery, Schroeder, and Kendall conducted a comparison of group, individual, and waitlist conditions at post-treatment, three-month, and one-year intervals. 37 8- to 14-year-old children participated in the study. Post-treatment, 73% of the individual control group and 50% of the group control group no longer met diagnostic criteria. At the three-month follow-up, the control group statistics remained remarkably similar. At the one-year follow-up, 50% of the individual control group and 67% of the group control group remained within normative levels. These statistics indicated no significant difference between the individual and the group control treatment. Over the last 22 years, various studies have evaluated different aspects of coping cat as a group-based therapy, a family-based therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy versus pharmacological treatment, and the effectiveness of various components of the intervention. In each and every study, the results were comparable in the effectiveness of the intervention as a whole. Now that we've had a brief overview of Coping Cat and know who the intervention was developed for, and have had a brief look at some of the research that has been used to develop the program as well as the success and maintenance of the intervention and how Coping Cat compares to other treatments, 
Donna will tell you about the intervention itself. Next, we're going to provide an overview of the session structure and the content provided in the Coping Cat Therapist Manual and Workbook. Session 1. Building Rapport and Treatment Orientation. The purpose of Session 1 is to get to know your client and explain the basic information about the treatment program. You'll begin to gather information about situations that make your client anxious and the client's reactions to signs and feelings of anxiety. Your first task in Session 1 is to build rapport. Because anxious children are often avoidant, generally fearful, and typically not familiar with our inquiries about their feelings, thinking, or self-talk, it is essential that the therapy not move too quickly. Rapport between the anxious child and yourself is critical to the success of therapy. It's certainly worthwhile to devote an ample amount of time to this establishment of a trusting relationship between yourself and your client. This is a critical step in session one. Next, begin to orient your client to the program. Do this by giving a brief overview of the program components. Provide a review of the reasons for the program and mention the goals of treatment, including being able to identify anxious feelings, recognize anxious thoughts, and use appropriate coping strategies. Then, begin to encourage and support the client's participation. Stress to your client the information that, from his point of view, is very important. Ask them to tell some stories of fun activities, family trips, or school events that were particularly enjoyable. Reward your client's participation, encourage verbalization, and ask easy-to-answer questions. Now, you will assign a Show That I Can task. These are the homework assignments that you'll send home with your client at the end of each session. We're going to end each session with an assignment. We call it a stick task. A stick task is something you can do to show that I can. You'll be learning lots of new things working with your therapist and doing this workbook. We want you to take what you learn with you and use those new skills in other situations. That's why we came up with the idea of stick tasks your opportunity to practice what you've learned. Then, at the beginning of each session, you can show your therapist what you have accomplished. It's your chance to boast. Another great component of the Coping Cat program is that the therapist manual provides tips from the trenches. These are suggestions and helpful hints from other practitioners who have been implementing the Coping Cat program. For session one, the first tip is to try to make the first session fun. You can do this by playing a game at the beginning and or end of the session, and you can also give the client a tour of the clinic in order to help ease their fears about coming to treatment. Also, like stated before, proceed slowly, because the therapy situation alone is one that provokes anxiety and that you, the therapist, often becomes another person that your client feels he has to please. It is also useful for you to have knowledge of your client's interests, likes, and dislikes prior to your first session. Knowing a little bit about your client shows your client that you are interested in getting to know him. This also will help aid in building rapport, which again is key and essential to the outcome of your therapy. You can also begin to normalize your client's anxiety by reviewing that anxiety is a normal reaction and that anxiety problems are common among kids. You can do this by discussing how many children go to your client's school and how likely it is that other children in your client's class have problems with anxiety. It is also important that as a therapist, you acknowledge, listen to, and respond to your client's concerns. Session 2. Identifying Anxious Feelings the purpose of Session 2 is to help your client identify different types of feelings and to distinguish anxious and worried feelings from other types of feelings. Your goal is to normalize feelings of fear and anxiety. You'll also begin to have the client begin to identify their own specific somatic responses to anxiety. 
and begin to develop a hierarchy of anxiety-provoking situations. At the beginning of Session 2, continue to make sure you build rapport with your client. Also, review your homework task from Session 1. Introduce the concept that different feelings have different physical expressions. Do this by discussing the idea that people's bodies can do different things in response to different feelings, and that different facial expressions and postures are clues to those feelings. Differentiate and label feelings. There are several workbook pages in the Coping Cat workbook that can help you explain these things to your client. You can also create a feelings dictionary by cutting out from magazines pictures that display physical responses of emotions and mounting them on paper and labeling the corresponding emotions below the picture. You could also role play feelings or play feeling charades. You could introduce the idea of role play to your client. Role play with your client acting out several different types of physically expressed emotions, taking turns guessing the emotion. Next, you'll want to focus on normalizing the experience of fears and anxiety. Initiate a discussion to reassure your client that all people have fears and anxiety, including adults who are admired and are brave or labeled as heroes. You want to focus on the fact that purpose, the purpose of the program is to help your client learn to recognize distress and to cope with it effectively. Stress that we all feel anxious at various times, but some of us are better than others at knowing what to do when it happens. Some of us are better at regulating the emotion, like adjusting the volume on the radio. The skills to deal with anxiety can be learned, and that the goal of therapy is to teach your client these skills. You'll begin to construct a hierarchy of anxiety-provoking situations with your client. If your client finds it difficult to be specific about their anxieties, you can use a procedure recommended by Olandic and Cerny in which your client tries to imagine an actual situation while you observe his behavior for signs of anxiety. This hierarchy will be later used during the exposure session. Tips from the trenches. You can introduce concepts first by referring to other people, rather than focusing on the child's own feelings or experiences. For example, you can discuss how the client knows what friends or family members are feeling based on their facial expressions and body postures. Begin with people who are familiar to your client without having to focus immediately on your client's own specific concerns. You can also talk about how animals show their fear, such as how a cat's hair stands on end or how a dog puts his tail between his legs. Mentioning that even animals sometimes get nervous or scared helps to normalize anxiety. Like we talked about before, with feeling charades, you can act out different emotions in their somatic responses. It is also helpful for you to have an idea in advance of the situations that your client may want to put on their hierarchy. If your client is having difficulty thinking of situations to put on the hierarchy, you can also mention some ideas specific to your client by suggesting that other kids I work with have been anxious about fill in the blank. Is that something you would like to work on too? Session 3. Identifying Somatic Responses to Anxiety. The purpose of Session 3 is to review distinguishing anxious and worried feelings from other types of feelings and to have your client learn more about somatic responses to anxiety and to identify their own specific somatic responses to anxiety. Discuss specific somatic reactions to anxiety. Introduce the variety of somatic feelings that are associated with anxiety, including butterflies in the stomach, heart beating fast, flushing of the face, and trembling. You can do this by telling a story about people caught in an anxiety-provoking situation and how each one feels during the experience. You'll also practice identifying somatic responses. You can do this using coping, modeling, and role play op procedures. The workbook also provides many great resources to teach these skills. Next, you'll introduce the F step. 
This is the first step in the fear plan. As part of the F step, the client distinguishes anxious feelings, monitors his somatic responses associated with anxiety, and asks himself, am I feeling frightened? How does my body feel? Next, you'll prepare for the upcoming parent session and assign your homework task. You'll always assign a homework task at the end of each session. Tips from the trenches. You can self-disclose anxious experiences of your own during stick tasks or at other times when asking the child to self-disclose. Recent or past experiences can help normalize anxiety. You can also use the fire alarm analogy to help explain the experience of somatic responses. Physical symptoms warn us when there is danger. Sometimes, though, the alarm will go off when there is no emergency, like a false alarm, because the alarm system has malfunctioned or is turned up too much. In these cases, you will help your client learn to send back the fire trucks because there is no danger. Session 4. First Meeting with Parents The purpose of this meeting is to encourage parent cooperation in the treatment program and to answer any parent questions. You'll want to make sure and provide additional information about treatment. You'll want to outline the treatment program and explain where your client is in treatment and what will happen next. Parents' questions should be invited and answered. You'll need to remind the parents that the first segment of the treatment is learning skills and that the reduction in anxiety is not anticipated in the chat until your client begins to learn to apply the coping skills during the second half of treatment. You'll want to provide parents with an opportunity to discuss their concerns. You can also use this as a time to learn more about situations in which the child becomes anxious and also offer specific ways the parents can be involved in the program. Tips from the trenches. You can show the parents a blank copy of the Coping Cat workbook so they have a better understanding of the session structure. You also want to set expectations for therapy. The goal is not the total elimination of anxiety, but the teaching of skills to know how and when to manage anxious arousal. Set expectations about the child's self-disclosure. Parents do not need to be concerned or report to the therapist every week about things that happened or be concerned that the child doesn't report them himself. It takes time for your client to feel comfortable. Reminder, inform parents not to grill the child after each session to try to determine what was discussed. It's also important that you as a therapist point out the strengths of your client instead of only talking about uh, anxious or negative situations. Session 5, Relaxation Training. The purpose of this session is to introduce relaxation training and its use in controlling tension associated with anxiety. As you begin the session, acknowledge the parent session. Reassure your client that you could tell his parents really care about him and that they are proud of his efforts. Encourage any questions that your client might have about your meeting. Of course, review your homework task, and then begin to introduce the idea that many somatic feelings associated with anxiety involve muscle tension. And then introduce the idea of relaxation and practice relaxation techniques. You'll also want to develop your client's awareness of how and when relaxation might be useful. Explain that relaxation training exercises are done to help your client realize what it feels like to be tense or relaxed and to help them to relax more quickly. Explain that under real-life anxious circumstances, your client won't have the opportunity to do a thorough relaxation exercise, but could probably take a few deep breaths and concentrate on relaxing those muscle groups that they've come to recognize they tighten the most. Next, you'll continue to practice relaxation, being coping, modeling, and role play. And then also, you'll practice this with their parents. Tips from the trenches. You can gently point out to your client the muscle tightness that they might not have noticed. You can also do the exercises with them during your relaxation training and modeling. You also need to remember that the relaxation exercises are used to teach your client how relaxed muscles feel 
as compared to tense muscles. The client is encouraged to practice so that they're eventually able to make their muscles feel relaxed without using the exercise itself. Once they can achieve relaxation without tensing first, they're able to become relaxed in any environment. So the key is to practice a lot. You also want to take a note of explaining this procedure to parents. Uh, younger children they'll, uh, will need uh, help practicing these techniques. Older children may prefer that you do not discuss this with their parents and will feel more comfortable practicing these techniques on their own. Session 6, Identifying Anxious Self-Talk and Learning to Challenge Thoughts. The purpose of Session 6 is to introduce the function of personal thoughts and their impact on response in anxiety-provoking situations. You'll help your client to begin to recognize their self-talk, expectations, automatic questions, and attributions in anxious situations, and help them begin to develop and use coping self-talk. You'll also review relaxation training. You'll want to review your homework task and then begin to introduce the concept of thoughts, which are self-talk. You'll suggest to your client that now he knows when he becomes anxious and that there are some thoughts that probably occur along with the feelings. You'll discuss self-talk in anxiety-provoking situations, which is anxious self-talk, and then you'll begin to differentiate anxious self-talk from coping self-talk. You'll then introduce the E-step in the fear plan. You'll explain that as part of the E-step, expecting bad things to happen, the client monitors his thoughts associated with anxiety and asks himself, what is my self-talk? What am I expecting to happen? Illustrate how if someone is thinking negative thoughts, the person can then attempt to reduce his distress through changing the self-talk co to, to coping self-talk. You'll then begin to practice coping self-talk. Next, it's helpful to go over thinking tracks with your client. These include walking with blinders, only seeing the negative and overlooking the good in a situation, the repetitor, if it happened once, it's always going to happen that way. The catastrophizer. If I'm always thinking the worst, it's ever going, is always going to happen. The avoider. Staying away from situations you think are scary without trying first. The mind reader. Jumping to conclusions about a person, thing, situation without the facts. The shoulds. I should always be perfect. I shouldn't make mistakes. The perfectionist. Setting expectations that are too high. Perfection is not a human option. Tips from the trenches. To help your client identify anxious self-talk, you can ask them to draw a picture of themselves in an anxious situation and then draw thought bubbles over the pictures. This activity can be helpful for your artistic and creative clients or for your clients who have difficulty verbalizing their thoughts and emotions. For your older clients, it might be useful to introduce the idea of self-talk by providing examples of television shows in which the main character is the narrator. You also need to check with your client about whether they believe their coping thoughts, because your client may be able to think of alternatives but not believe they are valid. A cl your client may need to be encouraged to generate thoughts that are non-distressing and relevant to their particular situation and be assisted in seeing their true merits. You also need to be careful not to fall into the trap of trying to convince your client that a scary event is not going to happen. A good strategy is for you as a therapist in the in your, and your client to reverse roles. Having your client act as the part of the coach or detective and trying to convince uh, you that a situation is not going to happen. It's also helpful to discuss with your client what might be done if their worst possible fear ever does come true. Session 7. Reviewing Anxious and Coping Self-Talk and Developing Problem-Solving Skills The purpose of Session 7 is to introduce the concept of problem-solving and to de develop the use of problem-solving strategies to better manage anxiety. You'll want to review your homework task and also review the first two steps in the fear plan. You'll then go on to introduce the A step, attitudes and actions that can help. 
You'll want to explain to your client that in addition to recognizing their anxious feelings and self-talk, they may find it helpful to take some action that will help the situation so they can proceed despite their anxiety. To do this, you'll discuss the concept of problem solving. You'll explain that problem solving helps to develop a plan for coping with anxiety. So the first step is to define the problem. What is the anxious situation? Step two, explore potential alternative solutions. What might someone do to make this situation less fearful? Step three, evaluate the potential alternative solutions. Which solutions are feasible alternatives? Do any alternative solutions not make sense or are not feasible? Step four, select preferred alternative. What might be one of the best things to do? What is the preferred solution? Depending on the developmental level, language, and cognitive ability of your client, uh, your problem solving strategy might have to be altered. Tips from the trenches. Brainstorming is done without evaluative comment. The merits of the various options are not examined until after the list is done. We don't want to inhibit your client or discredit a good idea before giving it a chance. It's also a good idea for you to have some suggestions in mind when considering alternative solutions. Here are some you could try. Uh, instrumental coping uh, was trying to change the situation. Yell or cry, which is an emotional intervention. Distraction, think about something else. Think differently, which is a coping thought. Seek emotional support from family or friends, or you could also do nothing. You can also integrate information from previous sessions here if that becomes useful for you. Session 8, introducing self-evaluation and self-reward and reviewing skills already learned. The purpose of Session 8 is to introduce the concept of evaluating or rating performance and rewarding yourself based on effort and performance. Review your homework's task and then jump right into introducing the R step, results and rewards. Summarize for your client the first three steps of recognizing his anxious feelings, recognizing his anxious self-talk, and applying coping self-talk, and taking some action that will help change the situation. Introduce the idea of rating his performance and rewarding himself for efforts to cope and to stay in the situation despite anxiety. You'll begin, begin to discuss the concept of self-rating and reward. You'll do this by describing a reward as something that is given when you're pleased with the work that was done. Give examples of reward using a story about teaching a dog a trick. If the dog learns the trick, he gets a reward, such as a dog biscuit, a pat on the head, or something else he enjoys. But the whole trick isn't learned all at once. It takes gradual steps. They get closer and closer to the complete trick. If a puppy has trouble learning a trick, his trainer tries again and again until he gets it right. Emphasize the point that at the beginning, the master might reward the puppy for doing part of the trick and that the puppy is rewarded each time he does something right. You can also make a list of possible rewards for the child. This will help them begin to brainstorm to be able to use this skill. Rewards aren't just for perfect jobs. Sometimes, even if I do a good job, things don't work out exactly the way I planned. Or sometimes I think I could have done a better job. In those cases, I still try to reward myself for what I did do well. After all, we can't be perfect. Like when I made a cake for my friend, but I forgot to take it out of the oven on time and it burned. I was still pleased with myself for thinking of my friend on his birthday, even though the cake wasn't perfect. Present the idea of a feelings barometer. Your client measures his own rating on their effort or performance. You can model the self-rating using the feelings barometer regarding a situation of your own. You then present a scenario to your client that they can imagine themselves in, and then allow them to use the feelings barometer to rate their performance. Review the fear plan and let your client create their own fear plan ID. Also begin to apply the fear plan. You can present a somewhat stressful situation and then use the FEAR acronym to help yourself talk through the situation. Then have your client and yourself participate together in a different scenario using a tag-along procedure. 
Next, you'll want to review your fear hierarchy and discuss exposure tasks. This will be in preparation for the following sessions. You'll want to acknowledge the upcoming parent session and answer any questions concerning that and assign your homework task. Tips from the trenches. Anxious children set high standards and rarely reward themselves for their accomplishments and instead tend to rely on outside sources for the sense of achievement. Encourage your client to feel proud of their accomplishments and ask your client to describe for you a situation in which they felt proud of themselves. You also want to encourage your client to pick a favorite activity for both you and your client to do together following a session in order to reward your client for their effort thus far in the treatment sessions. Social rewards are terrific together time. Be sure to allow time for the reward and follow through on the plan. Encourage your client to reward himself with positive self-statements, such as, I did a great job, or I did it. It may also be useful for the client to reward himself in situations where he is unable to provide himself with a material reward by imagining a pleasant event or scene. For example, when a child faces a stressful situation in school, he can reward himself by imagining himself jumping up and down or doing a victory dance. Session 9, Second Meeting with Parents. The purpose is to encourage continued parent cooperation in the treatment program, answer parent questions, and address parent concerns. You'll begin by providing additional information about the second half of treatment. You'll provide parents an opportunity to discuss their concerns. You'll also continue to learn more about situations in which your client becomes anxious and continue to provide ways the parents can be involved in the second half of treatment. Important parent information. The fear steps will be practiced in situations in which the child feels anxious or worried. Practicing these steps in situations that provide genuine anxiety to the client to see that he can cope and to find out what he thought was going to happen in the situation is unlikely to happen. The practice will be carried out in a gradual way. The client will start practicing with the therapist in situations that make him only a little anxious. Step by step, he along with the therapist will approach some tougher situations. Once the client builds confidence, he can try even tougher situations. The aim of treatment is not to remove the client's anxiety altogether, but to reduce it to a normal level and to be able to manage it. It's like turning down a radio volume from a high volume of 10 to a normal volume of 2. The radio is still on, the volume is just lowered. The client will experience some anxiety when practicing the skills, but this is to be expected and is okay. The more they practice facing these situations, the less anxious they will feel, and the more mastery and confidence that will be built. The fear steps need to be practiced repeatedly. Facing situations that make the client feel anxious will be practiced over and over again. Practice will take place until the client feels bored with the situation rather than anxious. The practice is done both in and out of session. Depending on the exposure task, the client may need to stay in the situation for a certain duration of time. The goal of practicing is for the client to realize that he can cope with the situation and that what he thought was going to happen is not likely to happen. If he gets out of the situation too quickly, then he has an experience that he can cope and the next time he enters the situation, he will feel the same or even more anxiety. Session 10 through 16, practicing anxiety-provoking situations using exposure tasks. The purpose of these next sessions is to practice using the four-step coping plan under low anxiety-provoking conditions, moderate anxiety-provoking conditions, and high anxiety provoking conditions using both imaginal and in vivo situations. Tips from the trenches. Be prepared and be confident. That is, know what features of the situation are distressing and have ideas in mind for addressing them. Be encouraging and supportive and exude confidence. It's amazing how youth will give it a go with the right preparation. Your style will influence the child's willingness to be involved. The exposure tasks are never punitive. Do not be drawn to protect your client from his negative emotions. 
One of the features of in vivo exposure is for you as a therapist to allow your client to become anxious. Any natural tendency to reassure, comfort, or save or protect your client is held back so your client can begin to develop and display independent skills for coping. Children may try to avoid the in vivo experience by engaging the therapist in talking excessively about the situation and all its difficulties. The concerns are addressed, but your client nevertheless approaches the situation. During exposure tasks, you also have to be aware of subtle avoidance. Subtle avoidance behavior during an exposure task will not allow your client to face the situations full on. For example, the socially anxious child may be imagining and practicing going to a school activity, but when he gets to the activity, he may stand by himself, not talking to anyone. The preferred experience would include engaging in a conversation. Another example could be a separation anxious child who brings a special object into an anxiety provoking situation in order to make the situation feel safe. Yet another example is the anxious child who uses distraction to think of something completely different when in the anxiety provoking situation. Although all of these behaviors allow the child to face the situation, in a way the child is prevented from facing the situation full on. It is okay for the child to use a behavior such as these as a coping strategy to begin with because this is a step-by-step -step process, but eventually it is preferred that the client face the situation without And that is the project. Coping Cat Intervention. Congratulations, you've made it through the entire presentation. John and I just want to remind you that this video is an overview of Coping Cat, its origins, and the research supporting the efficacy of the intervention, as well as the structure of the various sessions. For more information, we have included the various resources we utilized in making this video. Thank you so much for watching.